Okay, hello everyone. Let's see. Uh, so how's the sound? Okay, good. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Leo, Leonardo. Um, I'll start then. Um, I see I already have a good question about the 3-3 point. Yeah, it's probably not a good move if you're asking a computer program. And, but it's something I've, I'm, I've done before, and actually a long time ago. When I like to play this kind of diagonal opening, so it's, it's something I tried. Um, so my opponent Shiraishi Yuichi is he's a young younger player um, than I am, um, and he's a seven don, so he's moving up reasonably fast in the ranks, I suppose. And this is uh, the final of the B section of the Judon tournament, so it's I, I still have a ways to go in that. Um, elimination tournament before I can be in the final section, but it it does it did um, it is the final of the uh, B section. So um, I have the white stones, and this was my first game this year, as the thumbnail says. Great, yeah. So so I played this move. So this is a point where, uh, like basically. Katago on my computer, it, it likes star points anyway, so it'll, it'll tell me to play a star point like this. Um, but at this point, like, playing moves that I like, that might not be getting the best results um, with an, an AI, it's usually not a big deal. Like, it's 10, 20 points in the point system is... Um, it's not something that at, at my level at least you have to worry. in fact even i think at the top level in world playing they don't worry about it so much so so i don't worry about it so much because um it's like it's going to be a point or so it's going to be a fraction of a point or a point usually so it's not something that we would notice if we didn't have computers to tell us that it's bad um so yes uh rick rubenstein is asking about the diagonal opening, yes. So, um, it's something that I, I started seeing um, Iyama playing this kind of opening. He plays a lot of 3-4 points. And I think the basic idea is that people, when they research openings with a computer, they're generally expecting white to play star points because star points are just the recommended moves in most of the computer programs. And so people can have very good plans or opening preparation um, for these star points. And I think it's a, at this stage when there's a lot of players um, who seem to have a lot of, and I'm talking about professional players also, a lot of players that seem to have um, a lot of memorization, you might say, or, or um, pretty super, superficial knowledge about the opening which is based on something they've researched. And only a few of the very top players completely understand why why they have to play those moves. Like if you look at world champion level players, um, they can change the plan according to how their opponents do it. And, and, and the degree of the ability to do that, it re reduces um, even among professional players. Um, people don't have the full picture sometimes. And so taking it outside of the opponent's preparation is, um, I think it's a valid idea. I think, I think it's worth it. So, so that's part of what I'm doing here. And the fraction of a point in Komi, you might say, or um, maybe up to, I think at some points in the opening, um, in general, Katago didn't like my opening. So I think in some points I was maybe about 40, 60 in the, in the score thing. And the point is that when you play a 3-4 point here, um, if black plays here, then of course it would be a parallel opening. But white would get to the Mukai Komuku, or the, the facing 3-4 points, is an opening which um, does tend to give white a territorial lead, because black's going to be playing moves like this, um, floating into the 
And of course, um, Black doesn't have the opportunity to play those um, three three point invasions that people like to play nowadays. So so White will tend to have an opening with more territory than Black does. And so it's a kind of a, a strategy that I wanted to play. And people with Black who don't like that will play the fighting uh, Komoku, or the fighting three four point, which is um, this this move is facing White's three four point, and um, in Go theory that has been around for a long time before we had computers, the idea is that when Black plays a Kakari from these facing three four points, this leads to a very sharp position or a strong a fighting position on the right side of the board, um, and that would happen if White played a pincer or something, which is the old fashioned way of doing it. And Black would have an advantage because of um, the advantage of the first move would be exaggerated. Uh, so um, since Black has played first and is giving a Komi, in this case, of six and a half points, the idea is that Black does have to play actively in the opening. And so in this case, Black is getting an active opening. It means that Black is going to um, want to play this diagonally opening more often when White has played this second move. So there's... You could say if you don't like that kind of opening, you would say it's a, a, the danger that black will play a di diagonal opening. And if, so if you don't like that diagonal opening, uh, you would be playing a star point maybe in this corner. So white has that choice. But when white is played here, sort of hoping for this kind of opening, uh, there is a good chance that black will play the diagonal opening. So that's um, that was... Um, that, that was sort of part of the game strategy. So it's six and a half point Komi. People are asking about the Komi, talking about the Komi a little bit here. Larry Tarnas is asking, what do I think, what do I think about Komi? Okay. Um, as far as I know, they generally give um, black an advantage when it's six and a half points and white an advantage when it's seven and a half points. But... Um, Sometimes the computer isn't really set up to show that. Like, Katago is a computer that can sort of adjust to the Komi, so it will give you a different score depending on whether you have set the um, the rules at 6.5 or 7.5 points. And then there's programs like Leela that aren't, um, that are sort of set on 7.5 and they give you that score. And so it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to tell. And I think most of the Chinese programs are usually set at seven and a half although i think some of them you can change it if you really want to you you can change the size of the comi but so yeah you have to be used to that to be able to even um get that judgment from the computer so i played the three four point and black plays the kakari here and this is actually a position where okay so i played here um where and you know, there's this thing about how human players tended to play a pincer when Black has played a Kakari. And, um, and then computers would be telling you to play some kind of move like this or like this. And this is generally true, but this is actually a position in this uh, opening where it's diagonal like this. Um, humans have been been playing moves like this, or or it's one of these two. It's either this move or this move. Humans have not been pincering so much. Um, I can't really give you a percentage, but I'd say that most people will answer Black's approach move with a diagonal move or a nice move. And then if you really like to fight, you can play a pincer, but it's usually... I have found it difficult for white. So this is actually something where uh, humans were already playing this kind of move, even before we had AIs to tell it was good, tell us it was good. Yeah. So Black plays a, a corner control and closer. It was a choice between this one or maybe um, this one would be possible too. I would probably play a, an approach here. Um, I think this is actually sort of similar to something. Of course, the upper left corner was a star point, but it's sort of similar to something I saw with the AlphaGo versus AlphaGo games once. And I don't have a clear recollection, so I should probably stop it here. I think Black played something on the right side and White played this one, and it got into this kind of fight.
Um, so yes, so if Black had played in the lower left corner, I, I would have played a Kakari. Um, and, and in this case, White does have uh, an advantage. A, a larger number of stones on the right side. White has a one move advantage if we just isolate it to this right, right half of the board. So I'm going to be able to play a bit more actively than Black. So yeah, in this case, and Black answers here. So this is very standard up to this point. And I remember I, I thought for a bit. I, I thought for a bit. Okay, the problem with pincering Leonardo the Wagner, the problem with pincering is that um, basically, in a very general idea, um, when you pincer, and black, let's have white pin pincer somewhere around here, and black plays here, and people have researched this, pushing through and cutting is usually a difficult fight for white, and if white plays here, and you will actually see this variation in top professional play. So um, with various pincers. So it's not as if it's completely out of the question. Um, but computers will give black a good score um, when this happens. And most human players don't like to play it with white anyway. And so this is the kind of thing that people will avoid. And so white has to figure out a way to avoid that. So players who like to play something on the right side would be considering some kind of a high pincer here or here, um, or maybe starting with an approach in the upper right. These are all moves that have been played, can, can still be played, um, and that said, a computer will give them bad scores compared to, to playing something in the lower right corner. And this theory that black has an advantage on the right side and should be playing actively here, it's actually been around since the Edo era. So that was something like three or 400 years ago um, when they were playing a lot of three, four points. So they would get into this kind of opening. And, and you would see players... Um, low, low Kakaris were maybe a bit more, um, more popular. So you would see stuff like this happening, and Black would be playing um, a move that was both an extension and a pincer at the same time, which is supposed to be very efficient. So this is the basic theory behind that was around for hundreds of years that um, sort of defines why this is supposed to be a position where Black can play actively. Okay, Tanjue from uh, Twitch is asking an interesting Question, what do you think is more important? Playing the best possible move or playing the best possible move to your style? And um, both of those are important. But in the early stages of the game, I I think it's just human to want to be playing the move that's best for my style or move that I want to see what's going to happen. Something that um, makes me interested is probably more important to me than playing the move that will get the best score for the computer. Uh, and as I was saying a few minutes ago, it it's not as if it's going to change the result, the final result of the game in most cases. Like um, 10 points or even more points lost in the beginning. That's something that even the top players in the world don't, don't always worry about. Um, if they're playing a game that they are familiar with, that they want to play, if they're playing something that they like. Okay, I'm, yeah, so, oh yes, and yeah, I just want to um, stop for a moment and tell everyone that there's two big international tournaments coming up next month, so, um, right, um, yeah, so, so when I'm talking about a score, I'm usually talking, that's Rick Rubenstein asking about, just asking me to clarify here, um, when I'm talking about a score, I'm usually talking about uh, the points most of the AIs give us, which are kind of a percentage of winnings. So, so like if, if black has 60 and white has 40, basically the computer is saying that black won 60 times out of 100 playouts or something like that. And it's pretty, there's meaning to it. It's pretty accurate in its own way. Um, but it doesn't, the way it compares 
to the number of points you're winning or losing by in this in the in, in counting territory it varies depending on what type of game it is or how far into the game you are so towards the end of the game the computer can give you a score of 95 percent or something like that and you will towards the end of the game you might be winning by one and a half points or a half point and it's supposed to be a very solid from the computer's viewpoint but looking at from even a professional go player just one minor mistake will lose the game in that kind of a case so it's um it, it, for the human players it's we think it's closer than the computer does says and so and in the beginning the computer will quickly give one player or the other a 10 point lead or 60 40 lead and it's not a big deal is is my what i think oh yeah and i was talking about international tournaments there's the lg cup there's the final i think that's young jinxing is it? And the uh, other player would be Shin Jinzo, of course. Um, I have a tournament game on the on the seventh, which is when the first game was going to be. But I'll, I might be able to do the second or the third game of that title match, and that's going to be the ninth and the tenth of February. And the non non Cup, yes, um, yes, Leonardo seems to know. Then the spicy non ramen noodles cup is uh coming up at towards the end of february it starts in on the 21st and um iyama has is on a roll he's 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 won a few games already i think he won four games and he still has some very tough opponents coming up obviously uh this tournament is a, to a team tournament where um both the three countries uh korea china and japan put out five players each. And so Iyama is actually only the third uh, Japanese player to come out. And he only has, um, I think it's a couple of Korean players and maybe just, uh, or a couple of Chinese, one or two players from the two countries. So he's down to the last few players. Um, but they're they're going to be tough. They're like players like KJ and uh, Miyunting, I think. And of course, Xi Jin So. Um, so it'll be interesting. Um, he, Iyama is doing very well in this tournament, better than, I'd say, one of the best performances by a Japanese player in a while. So that's going to make it exciting. And so that's going to be from the 21st to the 25th. If they, I think, um, they'll probably play four or five rounds, depending on how it, how it happens. So I'll try to catch some of those. Um, I don't know enough about my schedule to say anything for sure yet, but um, certainly I'll try to get some of those games. So be looking for those. Yeah. Um, I actually find that more exciting than looking at my own games, but um, yeah, I enjoy doing both, of course. So at this point, Black has played the diagonal move. Actually, this is a point that's probably going to be one of the highlights of this game. And one other thing about Iyama... I think he's on he's um in good form right now. So it's um he does have a good fighting chance against the top players in the world. Uh of course he's the strongest player in Japan. Um he's been challenged by younger players like Ichiriki for instance in recent years, but he's doing he played a great game just yesterday. And so um I think he's in good style. He played a great game. That was in the title match, the Japanese title match. Okay, so back to the game. This is where the computer will tell you that white is supposed to extend. And I, I think um, next time I have a chance, maybe I'll play, I'll, I'll follow the advice here. So if white extends here, this is an important move that establishes white's control, you might say, on the lower side. And it sets up a follow-up um, here on the left side, where white will be starting to control the left side of the board and will be putting some pressure on this black group in the corner. So um, I think black will probably defend that by playing like this and white plays here. You can see that um, I was interested to see that Katago didn't like playing the corner enclosure from the 3-3 point at all. So it's just playing extensions here towards the sides. And um, I would say the shoulder hit at D16 seems to be a key point, but that wasn't the diagram that was given to me and something like this. Um, and a fight like this, where um, in this exchange to 13, I'm 
reducing the danger on the left side. So even if black manages to capture that zone at three, it's going to be on a small scale. And at the same time, I'm expanding the lower side. So black's going to answer with this. This makes sense. And a fight like this will ensue. So this is the advised uh, sequence. I'll, I'll, next time I'd probably play an extension one, um, but this time I um, I thought about it for a while, and I decided to, that today I would play in a, in a corner enclosure. Again, it's it's not a big deal. Like I probably, according to Kadawa, I probably lost a fraction of a point here, um, but it's not something I worry about. And black plays the pincer. Uh, so this is worth remembering because um, computers will tell you to pincer here. This is the the pincering point that is um, liked by most computer programs. And it's also the move that human top players are um, thinking of as the best move nowadays. So this is the pincer you'll see in top professional play. And it's sort of computer advised and also people like to play it because... Basically, when black plays here, this is a very effective way to control that area, making a very strong shape. And so, actually, Kadagul told me I should have poked out. This is a fight that I just, I still don't really like it very much. Um, an example of this fight. Um, white's sort of getting into trouble in the corner there, so white has to handle that. These are um, really complicated positions where white has weak groups all over the place, which um, AIs tend to be pretty good at dealing with, and I don't like them so much. So I probably, I'm not going to get into this kind of variation next time anyway. So it's an example, one of the variations. Um, but I, I felt happier just creating a sphere, an, an area where I had control and making a trade of it. Okay, so this is a move that you see. A way for black to approach white's strong position in the upper left corner. So that's a, a type of an unusual corner enclosure. Usually you start with a 3-4 point or something. So it's unusual in that it started with a 3-3 three, three point. Um, H3 is definitely better than G3. Yes. Leonardo, well, it's a good thing to ask. Let's go into that once more. Um, it's just that when, uh, usually black will not play G3. Um, sometimes you will see black play further away when there's, um, this is a position where it could be played. Um, it's a move that you play when you have something you want to do towards the right of that stone. So, um, for instance, you would be saying that, um, it's Mi, the left and the right are Mi here. This is, that would be one way to think about it. So if you have room to play a good move towards the right, such as this two space extension, then sometimes you would feel okay playing J3. Um, the problem with G3 is that when black captures that white stone like this, um, it's very small scale, and there's still some stuff that can happen in the corner. So it's um, the, the problems that black could potentially have in the corner, they're not really gone yet. There's, there's still, for instance, white could push, um, white's not going to do this too early in the game maybe, but white could do stuff like this and would have potential to live in the corner. So this uh, this would be a position where white could win and could live in the corner. For instance. Now uh, let's let's do that with this move. And white can live like this. So this is one example of how white could live in the corner. You can see it's a very small life, so I don't know if white would do it that early. But yes. So yeah, I think this is the best pincer. And this move here. Uh, this is a thing that black can do against white's uh, corner enclosure here. If white bumps against, which is sort of the natural move, black will play some kind of an extension towards the side. And when black does this, there is some potential for black to play here and be looking at the peep underneath. So this is... The peep on, on the second line there is a move that black will be looking forward to, to play. J16, uh, Tanjay says the symmetrical like shapes on the top make me, make me want to play J16 as black. And uh, he's right on the nail, basically. 
Um, in this variation, you see black playing there, and it is kind of a point that black will be looking at on the upper side, um, only he's trying to make some context with that attachment at d17 to make it even more efficient. So in the game, I actually played a honey underneath. Um, and this is a way that I can play. Um, I could have crawled here, in which case I would expect black to play here. And if white cuts, black will extend, just to give one, ex one example here. In this case, black would play all the way to k16. And again, would be more emphasi emphasizing the upper right area rather than that territory. Um, it's, not, it's not so much this territory but it's this area that black wants to control. So that's why black is black is leaving some space there where white could invade later at this point, but it's not a big deal. In fact, black could even sacrifice the three stones on the lift. In this case also, black will have moves like this, threatening to save that stone at two, or sometimes black will play a forcing move here, um, just getting some extra forcing moves. So that's how the stone at two is working as a sacrifice. In the game, I pulled back. The idea with this move is that if black covers here, I'm going to pincer at this point. So black could have done that, but my idea is that this black group is going to have trouble making two eyes. So maybe I, I'm going to have some opportunity to chase it a little bit. So he played a three space extension anyway. And next, if black plays here, that's going to be a big move. So I can't allow that. And instead of crawling on the second line, I invaded here, which is a more active move. And black plays here. Um, I think this is a pretty decent opening. Um, no big mistakes. Um, Katago was giving black an advantage at this point, but it, um, it was six and a half points Komi, so that's part of it. And it didn't like my 3 3 point and stuff like that. It didn't look like the shape I got into the lower left. Um, but I do want to sort of, I think this is a great opportunity for me to talk about this situation here, which is, it's not completely a black territory. And this is going to resemble a lot some stuff that go, that uh, Hoimbo Dosaku did about 400 years ago. He, he was, um, he, this is actually a kind of shape that has been played for hundreds of years. And um, Hoingbo Dosaku is a player I really like. He was called uh, he he was called one of the saints of Go. He still is called one of the saints of Go. He was a genius, and he was by far the strongest player of his time. He generally um, gave handicaps to mo all of the other players living at his time. And this is one of the shapes that he would get into, and he would play this move. So. Um, this is pretty much the same. Sometimes he would do this. So, so this is pretty much the same as uh, what computers are showing us now. It's very interesting to see that he played almost exactly the same sequences in some of his games. When white plays here, uh, black has a choice. This, this is the game move, and this is the other move that could have been played. Um, obviously, if black plays something very passive, uh, white's going to be able to live with something like this. So th this would make it easy for white. So black is going to cut here. Uh, this this would be a way for black to say, no, you're not going to live in the corner. This was not the game move. And, um, and capture the stone. So black, um, it sort of differs subtly with whether black plays from this side or this side. But this is generally considered bad suji. So let's let's do it just with this move. And white, okay, white has two choices. So this way, white is still trying to live. And it actually works to a dream because if black covers here, uh, this is going to re resemble one of the life and death problems that I've been putting out actually about last week. If black captures these two stones, white can cut here. And this is... Uh, let's just throw in once. Let's see. Did I? Um, let's throw in once just to make it more clear. And this is going to be bad for black, basically because um, if we make it a very simple race to capture, black has no chance to win. 
And so black's going to ignore that move and play something like this. And it's going to be a kind of a ko, maybe. Uh, or white can just leave that for later. White's already going to be happy even if white does something like this and develops on the left side. So Because that corner, it's not a black territory yet. So this is actually bad for black. And black has to back off at this point. Black has to play the hanging connection. White plays here. And this is just about... This is one of the problems I put out last week. This is one of the problems that I put out last week, and black can kill it if it's a if it's a life and death problem. The problem is that this is a real game situation, so this is the answer to the problem I put out last week, where when white plays the final Atari here, black can play here. And if this was a life and death problem, uh, there would be a black stone somewhere around here, and it would be set up so white would actually die. But in this real game situation, white's going to take the three stones. And we'll have no problem escaping out to the side. So actually, there's no way for black to kill it. Um, because the life and death solution, it's not working in the real game situation. So this is actually, in actual play, it's going to live. So that's one way to do it. Otherwise, something that we've actually seen with computer programs is this move and this move, which is setting up a ladder. So the ladder I'm talking about is this one. And actually, the ladder favors black. But at any time, uh, at any time, white can play moves like, like this, for instance. And if this is forcing, then this is going to be a ladder. Just pausing for a moment there just to check that I wasn't lying to. But this is a ladder. And so this would be bad for black. And that means that black will answer on this side and white gets a squeeze on the left. So this is actually something that I've seen um, in some computer um, research that I've done. And so it's something that can happen in some cases. In this board position, it would actually be a way I could play. So there's two potential variations here. There's this one where white is squeezing using the potential ladder. And these two, two attachments that are sort of the two attachments here that white plays are pretty amazing. And if black pushes through here, it's going to go into that variation. Or if black plays here, that's going to allow white to escape out into the center. So in this case, white would have the option of saving these stones. So that's four and six. Um, those are moves that... There was one game of Hoimbo Dosaku in which uh, it was very similar to this. He, he was playing the same points. And so that's that's something that really uh, it, it's entertaining to me when I see these moves that are liked by computer programs like Kadago that were actually played in a historic game. I'll, I'll probably have to find that game and and show it to you guys sometimes. So, in the game Black plays from above, this is another way for Black to do that. And White connects. If Black pushes through, this is going to be bad for Black. Partly because white has this move also. So this white has white can open a hole in black's territory on that side and also has the potential life in the corner. And so that's how I would be getting some profit out of this way. And black instead connects the stone in the corner. You can see he's take, making the most of it. This is the more, you might say it's the more greedy move when you compare it to just connecting here. Is uh, getting a better shape towards the left side, a more solid shape. And it's actually pretty difficult for white to make a living shape here. Uh, that chess guy says it, yeah. Well, reading ladders, um, it's a sequence of forced moves, so that's what makes it easy. And the fact that there's so many of them, and it's so easy to sort of have a kind of a hallucination there and... Um, move over one line to, in one direction or the other. So it's so many moves, I think that's what makes it so easy to make mistakes. And when you're talking about the game while you're doing it, like I do, then, then it's even easier. But at least I'm looking straight at the board. When I'm doing it with a demo board, I'm looking at the camera and doing that. Um, then, then I'm looking at the board from an angle, and it's even easier to make a mistake there. 
So you see a lot of commentators making mistakes with letters. Okay, so if I push through here. Um, it might look like white can manage something with this, but this is actually, it's going to die. It's going to die quickly. Um, so what happens here is black, if black played something like this, then I would be okay. I, I would play here and I would have enough room to live. So this would be alive. Or if black played something like this, I would have room on this side. So that's alive too. But what black's going to do... Um, okay, quiet. Black's going to play here. And this actually kills the white root. So, so first of all, if white connects here, black plays here. And this stone is coming into play. And white actually can't squeeze out, so it's dead. Or if white pushes through here, then black's going to cut here. And white doesn't have time to escape. It's, all of the black stones are working to, to surround white. Or if white breaks through here, it's just dead anyway. And these four white stones on the outside, they're not going to accomplish much either. So it's pretty much no profit at all. So this move, actually, it's, it's going to die in a bad way. It's not going to accomplish anything. So I push through here. In this case, if black covers, uh, white's going to have room to live. So that even though black bumped against white at three, it's still alive here. So that's perfectly alive. In the game, black plays the honey underneath. So this is actually um, a variation that has been researched by players in general. Um, quite often white will not cover on the second line. This is the move I played. Uh, quite often white will be pushing through here and black can connect here. And although white can cover here, it's a kind of a heavy shape that white has stuck to the strong black position on the left. So black will just, um, black could, black could play a hane here or black could actually play away. So this is going to be a fight where white is going to come under attack once more probably not so good. This is actually similar to what I did in the, in the game, but I didn't make it quite as um, heavy. I, I'm, I played a bit less um, heavily, but white can push through here and then just leave it for a while. This is a variation I got from Kadawa, where white's allowing black to connect on the side. So this is something that can happen, but in the game I just covered on the second line. I've sacrificed four stones in the corner, um, but it's not as if it's that bad because there's a number of black stones that are pretty much wasted in the corner here also. So there's, if we count those four white stones and the four black stones that I've marked, then white has played a number of moves from the outside and there's sort of a hole in the black area. I still don't really want to save those four stones on the outside either because if I do that, um, and black gets to play like this. Actually, black is playing the big area, and I'm just playing a bunch of stones that are going to be under attack for the rest of the game. So this is not so satisfying for me. Um, but I do manage to... If I, when I played the game move, which I played here, my idea is that I'm going to get more profit uh, towards the lower right area and sacrifice, probably sacrifice those four white stones. Okay, um, so here black, actually, um, maybe I should have played the attachment and that would be this kind of variation. It gets really complicated. Um, but I chose to play the pincer. That was a point where I um, thought pretty deeply about this and I uh, had trouble choosing between these two moves. So that's the two choices. In either case, my idea is to sacrifice four stones on the left there. So I'm sacrificing a lot of stones. Um, I guess it's fair to say that I like to sacrifice stones. Some people might look at it and say I'm just dying here. 
But I, I, I think I like to sacrifice stones and get profit elsewhere. But when I play down on the second line, um, you can see that I still have a bit of an attachment to these four stones on the left because I'm setting up a connection um, with one of these two points, either here or here. I can connect up at that point. So I'm still trying to save them. And Katago uh, penalized me a few points in the score for doing that and said that I should have just extended. So that was interesting. Um, and the idea is that the Hane on top here is actually a very big move, which was not played in the game. If black plays here and attacks on a large scale, then I will be able to save the stones on the left. But black is going to get some forcing moves here. At this point, if I cover here, then black has another forcing move here. So if I play here, then black's going to allow me to save my, my group with a sequence something like this. And black's going to get a very strong position on that side. So this is actually going to be a good result for black, where black is controlling the center of the board. And with 19, black is uh, setting up to sacrifice these two stones in the corner um, on a small scale and continue building in the center. So this is working well for black. Mm -hmm. Okay, getting lost in the variations here. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm trying to save them, but it was probably more important to extend to the center like this, as I was saying. And it's just that this whole area is a, is a pretty important area for me. So white one is doing a better job of reinforcing that. So that was a mistake. But um, when black played here, he's going after those four stones on a small scale. So that gave me some breathing space here. And um, in the game I played here, or I could have um, reinforced my Moyo. But I, I sort of like taking the territory here. Um, there's one problem with the whole sequence where I've sacrificed... I'm probably going to end up sacrificing eight stones in the lower left corner, and I'm okay with that. Um, and black has used a lot of stones to capture them. So it's like the number of moves there. Um, we do something that we call tewari, which is sort of counting the wasted stones. So if we say all of these stones are doomed to die in the end, and the four in the corner, of course, are already dead. And we take away a similar number of black stones. So that's uh, eight black stones. Black still had um, five, six stones in this area. So you could say that um, just getting rid of all these triangles we can mark six black stones that form the area. So there's these moves, and this was these were played against two white stones. So uh, we could say that um, it started out with a shape like this. So black did get something extra. But if we say that black isn't eventually going to play another move to capture these white stones, uh, then we get to take away one more black stone. So there's these two stones that were played in exchange for these two white stones. And then there's a move in the side, and these, and black used up another stone. So, so it was something like this. The number of moves that black used to make this territory in the, upper, in the lower left area, um, it's a shape. It's a number of stones that would be used even if white had not done stuff there. So it's not as if white has completely wasted all of those stones that have been captured. So that's what the Terawati does. It shows you a similar position. You can imagine a position that you think you know something about and compare it to the position that you've gotten into by subtracting an equal number of white and black stones. And the one thing that, about this that is slightly misleading, although I've subtracted the same number of white and black stones, the one thing that's misleading about this is that in the game, um, all of these black stones that are sort of um, it's it's hard to see uh, what they're doing, but they are creating a very strong shape for black hair. So black has this huge wall, which is extremely strong. That means that this area is very strongly controlled by black. Whereas if, if that whole exchange of eight white stones and eight black stones was not there, the control of that side would not be so big. And so that whole side is it's an area where I don't have much to do. And that's why I would say that going back to the white move here, 
Uh, okay, going back to this move. Playing there in the upper left, although it's a big move that improves my position in the upper left. Uh, that's why it was probably better for me to play this move, which improves my position in an area that is, you might say, it's more sparsely populated. It's, there's more potential in the lower right area. And yes, Aviok is asking, is black over-concentrated? Um, and if I could take off eight white stones and eight black stones and there would still be too many black stones, then I would say black is over-concentrated. Um, but it's not true of this position. Actually, black has a very... All of those white stones that I've sacrificed or am planning to sacrifice in most cases, um, they have caused black to play a lot of stones, but... Not as many as white, you might say. So I think it's actually locally, it's probably a bit better for black. And black is pretty efficient in the way that black has played the same number of moves. Um, but I'm satisfied in that I've, I'm controlling large areas of the board. And it's pretty much, on the whole, it's, it's even. Okay, so black plays here. Um, this is a fairly important move where black is trying to, is moving out with this stone, basically. In most cases, black is going to save this stone when black does this. And maybe putting some pressure on the white stone on the side. So this is a big point. White pushes. And yes, so when I play here, I'm looking at something that I want to do next in the upper right corner. Uh, I could have, let's see, what other moves? I, I, I could have played here. This would have been a very natural move. Moving out into the center and chasing black. Um, I could have done that. The reason I chose this move is that I'm looking at invasion points in the upper right corner. Maybe here and maybe here. So if black plays just some very slow move, then maybe I would invade from here. And I would be looking to, to get something like this to, to reduce the whole black area. Or if black played something that was slightly more threatening against my group on the right, uh, maybe I would be more worried about uh, black playing some very strong moves, like for instance, like this. And in the progress of this fight, maybe my group on the right side would get into trouble. So in this case, I would probably take this move. If black played something like this, maybe I would play something like this, which is more likely to connect up. So if black plays on the top, I can play underneath here. This is a kind of a test strategy where white can get a smaller chunk of the corner and a living shape on the side. So I'm looking at those moves um, when I play this move. So that was my reasoning behind that move. And black attaches here. Up to this point, black had a fairly good game. Um, but after black covered here, um, it started to look good for white. So black should have connected. And if I crawl, Black can cover here. Eventually, I'm going to have to move back to the to the left. So if, even if I do something like this, I'm going to have to bump against here at some point. And Black will probably play something to expand the corner there. This is going to be okay for Black. Um, or I can jump here, in which case Black is going to have... Uh, this whole variation was computer generated. So let's just show it to you. Um, it was fun to see it happen. It's probably a slight advantage for black. This is this is looking good for black. Um, but it's going to be a close game. So connecting, getting a strong shape in the center. Yeah, I'm ahead of myself here. So getting a strong shape in the center by connecting. Um, very important. And so that would have worked better for black. In the game, black covers here. And I push through and cut. And I can do that because if black plays here, um, I do have um, this forcing move here. And then I can connect. So this is really bad shape for black on the left there. And that's the reason why it's not so good. Actually, I might change the order here. Uh, it's safer to start with this. Um, but basically the same, the same variation. Yeah, so on this broadcast, I'm broadcasting on YouTube and Twitch. For some reason, the last time I did, I think I had the settings messed up. So the last time I did it, um, the Twitch didn't work. I'm very happy to see my Twitch is, seems to be healthy this time. So I'm back in business.
Okay, so black extended. And this is still looking at a black move here next. So by extending here and getting rid of the double Atari, black is setting up this move. Uh, but first I can extend here. That's what I did. And black escapes. Because if black plays on the left here, uh, this, this honey is just very strong. So that would be working for me. And I take the one stone, well, the two stones on the left. And black played here. So this was an interesting move. Um, black could have played something like this, and the fight in the center would have continued. Um, but when he plays here, he's setting up a cut here. So next, black can play here and connect on the second line, which is actually a big move. So the reason it's big is that after this, white has a, an ugly clump of stones there, which can be pushed around a little bit. So there's some extra value um, with a kind of a squeeze. And of course, black's group on the top, top side is very strong now. So that was the threat. And in the game, I played here. So um, this was probably not the optimal move. And so the idea here is something uh, a little bit subtle. And it's also very general. It's something that happens in games all the time is that it has to do with this situation in the corner that I was talking about. Black has such a strong position there that um, the effect of white's playing a lot of moves on the left. So the moves I'm talking about would be moves like this and following up maybe like this and then eventually something around here. All of these moves have very little effect on black's position in the lower left corner. Like they're, they don't even touch it. It's impenetrable. And so that makes anything on the left side relatively unimportant. And it's an extreme case. So even when white plays here, black didn't need to answer it. So black actually played away. And so maybe this was a bit premature. I, I, I could have, um, capturing, capturing here would have been a move that would have changed um, what happens in the center by weakening the two black stones and it would have fixed my territory in the upper left It would have been a big move. So maybe this would have been better another move that I uh, a kind of natural looking move that I could have played would be something in the center which would um, put some pressure on the two black stones also So these would have been natural moves Usually this move would be just uh, naturally answered by black playing something like this and maybe extending or connecting um, so it's a pretty important point, I think, that um, maybe my move was a mistake, but it's probably more important to say that the basic point here is that black doesn't have to always play the left side here when the value of the left side has been reduced by the fact that black has such a strong position here. Whatever, white can play a lot of moves there and still doesn't hurt black in the least. So black played this move in the center. I pushed and yeah, I cut here. This just looks such so much the better move. Um, I could have escaped with this, but you know, people don't like to play the empty, empty triangle. D11. A D11 would be a dangerous move for black. You want to try that one? So that's Thumper is suggesting Cross cut after d11. I'm not sure I understand that actually. Um, playing here would just be an overplay for black. So black's not going to do that. Um, maybe I'll wait to see what how that develops. So I cut here. So if black answers that cut with something like this, then I'll then I'll be able to make much better shape in the center. And there's Samaji with those two stones on the side also. So that was the idea with my cut. And black answered by playing here. And this captures three white stones in the center. So I, you might say I've sacrificed some more stones. So I'm doing a lot of sacrificing here. Um, some people might just say I'm, I'm dying, but I actually have a plan. Um, first of all, if black leaves a dame open here, then I will be able to play here and push through. And this will win the race to capture. So this is good for white. Or if black goes straight down, 
Uh, now I I can do it anyway, but let, let's just for to make it simple. Let's play these Ataris first, and White's going to win by one move. It would be more profitable for me to start from this side with the same result. So it's that's a collapse for Black. When Black fills a liberty here, uh, that's not going to work anymore for White, and Black um, has two choices now. So Black can connect on the can play on the second line. And black's going to win by one liberty now. Because white has only two liberties in the center. Or black can actually go down. And there's some potential that at some point I might play one and three just to see which of these black plays. Um, but black has a choice here. So black's going to choose between playing at four or playing at five, depending on the situation on the right side. So back to the game. Uh, what I did was I played an attachment here and cut here. So this is the Tesuji, where I'm trying to get some forcing moves. I have a whole bunch of forcing moves on the left. So various points on the left that are sort of forcing. Um, just to define that. For instance, there's this move that's forcing. And if I play there, I'm threatening to push through here and capture some black stones. So at least I would be getting three black stones on the left which would usually be good enough to make this a success for me. So I have a forcing move there. Uh, I actually have some forcing moves usually in this direction also, depending on kind of a ladder uh, towards the left. So it's not actually working here, um, but I, sometimes I can get a ladder pointing in this direction. So I have one or two forcing moves there on the left. So um, one is definitely forcing, and like if we say black actually plays here, then three is also forcing. And with no context, they're not accomplishing very much. So I have to start with the corner and see how it turns out. So for instance, if black plays here, and white plays here, and let's see, black does something like this. This is going to be bad for black because I have all these forcing moves. So let's see how I can fix that. Um, okay, in this case, I would probably go... I could actually do it from... One way I could do it was I could play here and here. Okay, so if black plays here... Um, I have a forcing move. Uh, I, I'll probably play this somewhere along the way. I have a forcing move here, which is threatening L18 and P18, and there's no way for black to to get rid of both of them. So this would be a collapse for black. And if black plays down here, um, although I'm sacrificing uh, six stones now, getting these two Ataris, it's completing my territory on the left here, so there's some profit in that. And also I get a squeeze here. And I'm going to get the corner. So I win the corner of semi And uh, something like this maybe. I have to be careful of this guy. Um, something like this. So th this would be okay for me. Um, I would be, I mean it would be very good for me. I'd be getting a lot of territory. So you can see there's a lot of bad Aji here. In the game, uh, Black played a very safe move, um, which was probably really bad. <laughs> so it's, sometimes it's bad. Um, it's sometimes it's bad to play the safest move. So what Black should have done is Black should probably extend here. And this, it, it, I still have to try to mix the two possibilities. So I'm going to push through here. Black can capture these two stones. So that's forced. And then I'm going to be playing here. At this point, I'm already looking at a potential double threat. So the double threat that I'm looking at, let's just, uh, let's see, where shall I put a black stone? Maybe here. The double threat that I'm looking at is this one. 
where if black extends here, I can play a, an Atari on the right. And this would be a collapse. So I, I, I'm going to be able to pick up something on the right there. If black pushes through here, uh, for instance, for instance, something like this, it's pretty much the same story. So it would be like this. Although I might push through first. I, pushing through on this side might be the more more attractive move. If black plays on this side, I get now I get these three stones. <clears throat> if black plays here, now this is really working well for me. Uh, something like this. And I would probably finish off these two stones. Or something like this, maybe. So this kind of squeeze where I trashed the whole black territory uh, was pretty much the idea. Um, variations on this thing. But black would be getting a good position in the center. This would be close to even, I think. So this was probably the strongest move. I thought I could sort of combine the potential on the left and the right. Uh, is Garfield Blair a Japanese person? That's That sounds uh, very much like a Japanese phonetic thing. So, konnichiwa. Um, so that was some Japanese for Garfield, who wanted me to speak Japanese. So what I did was I, uh, what Black did, um, was he played here and connected. So that got rid of that problem. Again, if Black plays on this side, I will be able to sort of combine the right and the left here. Um, if Black extends, this is probably going to be bad. I already have a double threat here. So I'm threatening to capture at R18 or capture the two stones on the outside. And black can't deal it deal with it with this move because I have the Atari here. And I can capture those stones. So capturing the one stone on the left is big too. So black would have to play something like this, and I would be able to capture capture these guys. So that would be good. Or black would have to sacrifice the two stones. So black's probably not gonna do that. Um, something like this, something like this, and I would be able to live on the upper side. Black would be getting the corner and would still be capturing those three stones on the left. And it would be fairly close to even. Um, in the game, I think I actually got an advantage after black played here. I got to push through here. So this was, um, it had the advantage that it was, I'm reinforcing the one group that I had that was potentially in there was some potential that that's white group was going to be weak so in increasing the territory there is making it into a solid territory that's a good a good group that i built and also i um still have some forcing moves against the black territory if black plays something like this i can play here again i'm threatening that cut at m14 and I can squeeze black like this. So this would be a good result for me. Um, again, I'm taking away black's territory there. And black did get something back on the upper side, but this was really good for me with this beautiful shape um, surrounding the right side. So th this is probably a win for white. Black answered this. And the really satisfying move here is that white gets to play here and, as a forcing move. So all the time... Um, that potential for black to play here and scoop out my upper left corner, that was actually a pretty serious thing. It was something that we had to pay attention to. So this, this was an issue. And the fact that in the natural sequence here, I get that opportunity to play here as a forcing move makes it very, very effective. Um, because white is threatening if black plays away, White is threatening to push through here. And this would just win the race to capture. So that black has to answer that. And so it's really painful for black. So you can see uh, all, I'm, I'm being captured all over the place. Uh, but these areas that I'm making are actually, they're more valuable. So this is a game where sacrifices actually um, worked very well for me. And I finished off the left side. This is at this point. It's a it's a big move. 
and black attaches here. So I was seeing this in variations from Katago, and it was a move that I had been worried about during the game, and I had a plan for it. I talk about sacrifices all the time, Chris Davis. Um, let's see. Okay, Leonardo de Wagner is saying, sacrificing above the third line is a concept I struggle with. And it's probably good that you struggle with it because usually sacrificing um, high up towards the center like these three stones Usually it's a bad idea. In this case, it's only working because I already have a strong position on the left. And I'm combining it with that potential in the upper right corner. And so as you see in this finished position, sort of, um, Black's shape there, capturing the three stones, it doesn't really have very much potential to act as influence towards the center of the board because there's nothing to do in the center of the board. So it's conceivable that this kind of capture would be huge if Black had some potential moyo or something in the center of the board. But in this board position, where I have settled all of my groups and the center is relatively small, it's not working that way. So it's a rare case that I can sacrifice towards the top the center of the board. And it's good that you don't feel comfortable with that. So when Black plays here in the double honey, oh yeah, okay, he didn't play the double honey. <laughs> so with the double honey here, uh, this is uh, Tesuji, one of the ways that Black can attack an extension. So the extension I'm talking about is this extension where we have a white stone, uh, two white stones, three space extension with one on the fourth line and one on the third line. It's a very common shape because it's usually pretty good um and against this sometimes you can invade on the third line but when you can't do that quite often attaching here is an option that you have so attaching and doing the double honey and white cuts black extends basically there's two potential ladders here where black can capture the ladder here or if white takes the one stone black can capture no ladder on this side so there's two potential ladders that black is um hoping to to make Ideally, both of these ladders have to be good for black. In this particular case, the ladder on the left, it doesn't always have to be good for black. Uh, but black could probably manufacture some uh, ladder breaking move with something like this. So black could play something like this and have a ladder. So this is, um, black might wait to do that for later. But those are two forcing moves that black has that would make this ladder work. So in a real game, I would probably play here first. And if white did that, I would play here. If I was black in a real game, that's. Um, so yes, so this is obviously bad for white. And to avoid that, I would probably play here and a variation like this again, something like this, where black is getting some extra stones towards the center. So I'm okay with that. And it would, con I would still be uh, winning the game in this case. So I, I think I've gained a lot in this trade in the upper right corner. And I've in this fight here, I, I gained something. And I have a good position at this point. And Black played here is trying for something better. So what Black is trying to set up is that if I answer here, and then Black plays here, and White does the same thing as before, Actually, this is not so good for Black. So Black's going to do it this way. Black's going to do it uh, in this direction, maybe. And the point is that with these forcing moves, Black has set up kind of an Atari where Black can get into the corner. So, so Black would be doing stuff like this and break into the side. So um, those forcing moves that Black played with this stone and this stone, they just made it more viable. So I'll leave it there. Um, and I, in the game, I avoided that kind of stuff playing here. I'm giving black the corner, but actually I'm getting a good position on the outside. So it's okay. 
In fact, this is probably okay. It's probably good for white. And I have some potential to attack black in the center of the board. I started with this. And black actually cut me off, which was a bit of a surprise. And here I... It, it's interesting. At this point, I decided once more... I decided once more to sacrifice the six stones on the left. And Katago was telling me just move out. So the, the Katago variation is something that I still feel a bit uncomfortable with. <laughs> and uh, so let, I'll just show it to you. And white is... Okay, white's playing as if there's nothing happening in the center. And it looks like black is trying to kill the white group. And this is supposed to be an easy win for white, according to the computer. And it's also the kind of situation which can go sour very easily. So it's it's not something that I would be feeling comfortable playing. It's a, kind of a dangerous uh, variation here. And I, I didn't want to get into this kind of fight when I had the feeling that I had an advantage. And so I played here. So basically what black is trying to do with this Hane is that if white cuts here, black can push through here. And if white covers, black wins the race to capture. So if white pushes through, then black pushes through. And you can see how this stone here is making it, um, it it's giving black some extra forcing moves in the center of the board. So it's giving black some extra momentum. So that would be how the, the Hane there was working. And I played here. My idea was that if black pushes through once more, I'm going to play here. And I'm just going to capture. Um, let's see. I can't capture it in the ladder, so I'll play here and capture it in the net. Or if black tries to escape. This is going to be bad for black because... Um, because I can push through here and capture it. Now I'm going to win on the left. So that was the general idea with this move. And black just connected and took these stones. And I played the hanging connection. And I've built a strong position. I've in improved my lower side. I sacrificed again. That's In this case, it's just 12 points. So it's not a big deal. Um, I'm, I'm getting some thickness towards the center. So in this direction, I've gained some stones. I have a slightly better position here and I'm attacking these stones. And so it's important when you're attacking to have some um, end result in mind. So I'm, I'm, I don't really, I'm not op optimistic enough to say that I'm gonna capture those three stones, but my goal is actually gonna be to make a perfect territory here. And that's an issue because, for instance, black always had the cut here. And if I play an Atari here, at an early stage, this is actually what I'm going to do. Because this will give me Sente, but black will be able to capture this zone here. So that's an issue. There's also a lot of Aji with black doing stuff like this, or doing stuff like this. Um, it's going to be very annoying if black has time to do that. So by attacking black's three stones, in the center, my biggest goal, you might say, is to, to, to build a line of stones here to finish off this territory on the right. So that's what I'm trying to do. And because I'm attacking, it's something that I'm going to be able to do. So black, okay, this was interesting. Black played here. I have to be careful of the connection here. So black's setting up a connection here where black can um, save by connecting on the second line. If white plays, for instance, if white plays here, uh, this would cut off the white stones. Uh, so that's that's what black is trying to do. Black is also um, trying to set up a position where he can play this honey without having to worry about the cut here. So so if black can make this shortage of liberties for white, black will be able to play the honey at four. Because obviously this is bad for white. So I played down here, um, stopping both of those threats. So on this side, I can cover here, and now black will not be able to connect underneath. So for instance, like this, I can connect on the first line, and black's not really gained anything here. 
And also, if black plays here, I can still cut now because I have a stronger position on the right. And so finally, I get to play this. And I'm, I'm feeling better about my territory here, but it's not finished yet. So for instance, um, if black cuts here, and now I can capture by playing here and here. So I've cap because I've played the connection here as a forcing move, now I can capture that. So you might think my territory is okay, but black does have um, black does have this move. So if I answer this um, stopping the connection, now black can cut here, and this would just capture the white stones. Or if I play here, now this is going to capture three white stones in the center. They're already dead. And so this would be a very big move. In actual play, I might answer black to at, on the outside, and black would be able to connect up. So that's one thing black can do. Also, in some cases, if we just ignore the fact that black is weak in the center, um, I'm talking about this, this black group. If we ignore the fact that this black group is, right now it's under attack, uh, sometimes this move would be, uh, potentially this would be annoying in some cases. It sort of depends. Uh, maybe I'm okay. Uh, but at the very least, black would have this move. So it's not completed yet. I still have to work on that. So that's what I'm doing with this move. We have a little exchange here where black is threatening to cut me. And so this is the extra stone that I was trying to get in there. Um, just to get rid of that cut at P14. And finally, this move. I still had that issue there. So, um, yes. So, for instance, if I had played away and black had played here, if I play here, black can cut here and wins, obviously. If I push through, now black wins anyway. But, aha, you might say, what if white plays a honey and black cuts and white can escape in this direction? And this is going to be a bit of trouble because black has an attachment here. And this is bad for white. This is bad. I can play here, I guess. Uh, but I still have to defend that. And you can see black is getting into my territory. So that's something bad that could happen in that variation. So there's still an issue after black extends here. There would have been different issues if he had played this way. He, he still has to play something to save that group in the center. So he had a choice here. And I finished it off with this. Um, which is actually, incidentally, it's the way to finish off the upper right corner endgame. Um, if white had played, if we look at the upper right corner locally, if white plays here, um, this move will not be forcing. So it would be a big move, but it would be giving black sente. When I play here in the game, I'm threatening to uh, just give a random move to black. I, I'm not saying that's a good move at one, but white has the squeeze here. And if black covers, uh, now there's the issue of this move. So I could even just connect and black would have to come back. Or I could, I could uh, extend here and it would be more of a problem. This would be a bit of a problem for black. So black answered here. Um, I sort of regret this move. Like I, when I played this move, I'm trying to finish off the game. I have an I've established an advantage um, in the fight here, and I made it even more solid as I surrounded this territory on the right. It's a territory now, and I'm trying to wrap things up. I played this move when I played it. My idea was that I would play this exchange. And then I would play here, because this, at this point, it seems to be the final big move. Um, and I changed my mind. After playing J19, I changed my mind just because any move, even connecting here or playing something like this, any move on the left side here is, is actually a pretty big move. So, for instance, if black plays here and does stuff like this, This is going to be forcing. 
And um, so black can get some extra forcing moves there, reducing my territory. Anything in this general area, it's just, it's going to be a big move. And so I changed my mind after playing that. And I decided that this was the biggest move after all. If I'm going to play here, I didn't need to play that exchange. So although it turned out to be Sente in the game, I might as well have just captured immediately. And there's no reason to play J19 immediately. It's something that sort of bugged me. It's probably not a big deal. But you could say that at this point, it did, did give the uh, black player an opportunity to, for instance, choose something different. So, for instance, something like this. Um, a variation of something like this, where I would have that cut, but like it's just it's just about 10 points of territory. It's not as if it's a game-finishing move. The stuff that black is doing on the left side and then the center, arguably it's more important. So it, it gave black an opportunity to confuse things which I didn't need to give black. And so I sort of regret that I played this. At the time, I was thinking that I would play play this one. So I, I had a different plan. Um, in actual practice, he answered it here. Um, basically, locally, if black, locally, there is this move here where white can cut. So if white cuts here, um, just chasing it directly doesn't work. But of course, uh, there's enough room to make a, a, a net. There's a number of ways for white to kill it. So white could, otherwise white could play here and squeeze the center first. It's hopeless for black. So black's not going to be escaping it through here. So that was something that bugged me after the game, but since I got to this point, in this case you could say it's, it doesn't make any difference. This was an, an exchange that eventually it would have been a sente endgame move for me. Um, and I managed to play it earlier. I think I lucked out a little bit there. And it's, this simplified the game to a great degree. And the point is that this capture here, um, it simplifies things by getting rid of all the, that stuff that Black could potentially have done on the left side. And while this is a big move, this is a big move, but um, I have a big move that's sort of equal to it in the center of the board. So Black has taken the left side here. That was a kind of a force sequence. But I get this move in the center, which is, uh, in general, people say that playing surrounding the center is small. But this move in the center, it finishes off something like 10, 15 points there in this general area. Where black, um, as I was showing you just now, black did have some potential reducing moves against that white position in the upper left corner. So this was pretty significant. It was big enough to be pretty much equal to the to the black moves on the left side here and it simplified the game so i'm wrapping up finally and at this point um i have a solid lead i'm ahead even before komi um it's amazing that it, it went so well for me actually. and finally we have this little thing that's going to happen okay yeah this, this thing here um i could have pushed through but then again like if black extends here, it's not a big deal because I can connect up with five. But black can play this move. And this is um, this is a bit of a headache. So if I play this way, black will play this way and break into the territory. I just, I, I like to show these things, I guess. If black plays this way, I mean, if white plays this way, yeah, this is breaking into the territory again. Black wins. Or breaks into the territory. And if white connects here, this is going to be a collapse too. Um, black has more than one way to do it, but I guess this is the easy way. And black wins. So this is really... Uh, would, would have been bad. And I have to capture from the other side. This gives black some potential profit by playing here and I cannot connect. So there's a, a potential gain there for black. So it was worthwhile for, for black to play that exchange. It was a slight gain. Now black plays here. My lead will disappear if I do something like this and back off. So I have to go down. 
kind of a final challenge here. So if I do something like this, and Black gets to extend his liberties, and then cut here, this is going to develop into a squeeze. And again, my lead will just disappear. So the important move was that I played here. And it looks sort of dangerous. But um, if Black plays here and here now, it's not forcing. So that squeeze uh, was not working. And for instance, I could play here. Or I could actually play here and sacrifice two stones on the right. That would be okay for me also. In fact, probably better. In the game, Black cut immediately, and I pushed here. I guess it's a good time for me to give you the result for the game. Yes, yeah, so uh, at this point, Black resigned. Basically, Black can capture two white stones by playing here. Uh, but it's just, it's not worth it. And white, white's actually getting a, getting a number of points. And this little area here was an area that, uh, it's not, uh, previously it was looking like black might be able to get some points there. So my getting a few points while squeezing black here and just giving up two stones on the right. It's actually a profit and gain for white. So it was at this point that black resigned. Um, and I had a lot of fun playing this game, uh, basically because my sacrifices were actually working. So quite often I set out to sacrifice stones and it's something I like to do. Um, it doesn't always work well, so sometimes it can end up in um, a bad result. But in this case, actually, the sacrifices in general, like first I started with sacrificing these stones. This was actually something that I was I had researched. It's some it's a pretty standard variation where I sacrifice this the corner. So obviously it works to a certain degree. And I was planning on sacrificing these stones and then this sacrifice. Um as it turned out, they all worked fairly well. So I was to a certain degree I was lucky. Um but also I, I had the right idea. So that was a very satisfying thing about this game, I think. Um I played a good way a good game um for once. So usually um there's a lot more problems that I have with my game and I'm not so satisfied. But I'm pretty pretty satisfied with this game. I did well on the whole. Although I did tell you at the beginning, uh Katago did not like my opening, so it's, it's something I might be changing. Okay, so just to finish now, don't forget to to like my uh videos and <laughs> Uh, give me the thumbs up and uh, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And um, I put up a Patreon link. Uh, take a look at my Patreon page if you're interested. And so I will be making some, I'll doing, be doing some lives next month. I can't really promise anything yet. Just to give you the tournament schedule once more, there's an LG Cup final. I think it's Yan Din Xing uh, and Xin Jin So, if I remember correctly, that's gonna. I just have the dates here: it's, uh, the seventh and the ninth and the tenth of February. Uh, turns out I have a tournament game on the seventh, so I won't be doing that. Uh, but I'll try to do one or two of the other games. And then there's the Nanjing Cup, where Iyama is still still alive in that tournament. He he beat four top players in the world. Um, it's I'd say the Nanxing Cup is one of the most challenging tournaments to be participating in, although I have not done so. Um, but it would be, because it has the five top players in the world. I mean, the five top players for each country. So the five top Korean players, the five top Chinese players, and the five top Japanese players. Um, so on the whole, it's a smaller and more elite group of players, even if you compare it to the other international tournaments. And so, and he's going against the final players of Korea and China. So Yama is going to be playing some very challenging opponents, even for him, although he's the top Japanese player. And that's going to start on the 21st of February, and it's scheduled to go on to the 25th. I think it depends on how well Yama does, of course. Um, I think there's only three opponents left. And there's two other Japanese players. So it probably number of rounds played depends on um, whether someone beats Yama or not. 
and, and that would pull out the extra Japanese players. Otherwise, they might not even get a chance to play. So uh, that's it. I don't really know exactly what my schedule will be, so it, um, I can't promise to cover every game, but I, I would like to cover some of those games also. So that's it for today. Um, I'm looking forward to all these international tournaments uh, coming up next month, and I will be trying to do more lives, um, probably a weekly live. Um, I usually schedule it on Mondays, so so that's my plan. So see you next time, and uh, thanks for all the support and everything, and thanks for being here to the end. Goodbye, everyone.